Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Vlog 5, the early career academic interview. So this is our first vlog where we start to enfold career conversations into our work. So what I'm going to do with you in the vlog this week is prepare you for that first post PhD early career academic interview. So what this means is level A and B lectureships in Australia, a lecture post in Aotearoa, New Zealand, a lectureship in the UK, and also particularly an assistant professor role in Canada and in the United States. Now it may seem very odd to you that the first of these career sessions that I talk about with you is on the interview. Why aren't I talking about the CV or indeed the application for the job? There is a reason. Interviews are diagnostic. They reveal problems. So what we're going to do through this interview that I'm going to present for you today and you're going to answer me back, what we're going to do in this interview today is I'm going to reveal the areas that you do incredibly well now, which is terrific, but it will also reveal the challenges, the issues and the areas, the languages that we need to work on for you. So what I'm trying to do today is find a way to transform your experiences and your expertise into evidence, evidence that you can use in an interview. So what we're going to do is create a series of narratives of your academic life, academic case studies that you can slot into an interview when required. Now this interview today is particularly geared for academic posts. I will do other vlogs particularly on the private sector, small, medium sized enterprises and also interviews for tenders and consultancies. They are different genres but I thought we'd start today with the academic one. But first we need to do our shout outs. Firstly to the wonderful Andrew. Every Friday afternoon it appears a remarkable gentleman comes and sits in my office and tells me wondrous things and Andrew was that guy last Friday and it was just amazing Andrew you're a great human being Graham star you are mate Sue all my love all my hopes to you I actually now have two Sues in my life to match my two Bruces so maybe we should introduce the Bruces to the Sues and I'm sure magic will ensue and I also want to do a specific shout out if I can to Daria Daria you are an outstanding scholar it's a pleasure to spend time with you and I have no doubt that the future of higher education is in your hands. So I want to dedicate this gig to you today. I also want to do a shout out to the wonderful women who said, Tara, we need a vlog on how we get a job. So that is Elise, Anna and Danielle. Guys, this one is for you. Let me know how I go. Let me know what you'd like me to do next. It was a great suggestion. Let's go for it. So how I'm going to frame today is as follows. I'm going to ask you particular questions clustered into particular topics. And let me tell you how I got those questions. Here's my iPad. I have 82 interviews. Yes, 82 interviews that I've conducted during the life of this iPad. So on the long weekend, I got all the interviews together, trawled them, clustered all the questions into the particular topics and areas, and picked the best ones. So all the questions I'm about to ask you are real questions that happened in a real interview. Uh, and how you handle today's vlog really depends on you. If you would like to test yourself and test your ability to answer these questions in real time, then do so. When I ask the question, press pause on the video and answer it back. Now I would advise obviously perhaps don't do this in public areas if you're on public transport. They probably will call security if you do this and also do tell your family what you're doing so that they don't think that someone's broken into the house and is interviewing a cat for an academic post so just make sure they know what's going on and I know a lot of you watch these vlogs which is just lovely I think with your partner or with your kids so invite them in for this one and answer the questions and they can judge you and see how well you go and what will then happen is after I've asked the question I'll have a pause then I'll explain to you why it was asked 
and what the academics, what the university wants to get out of that question. And remember guys, I always tell the truth, always. I never pull punches. Most of you know I've worked in nine universities in four countries. I've worked in four of the Australian states. I'm brought in as an external examiner, a consultant, a panel member, an examiner. On we go through universities around the world. I just finished a gig with Canada and a Canadian examination panel. And I am a scholar of higher education. I'm a scholar of the higher education workplace. And I currently, right now, have three articles under review looking at the contemporary state of the higher education workplace. So guys, this isn't just about my vibe or my feeling, this is actually what I do for a living. So are you ready? Take a breath. Let's begin. Interview voice, you ready for it? Thank you very much for joining us today and thank you very much for participating in this shortlisting process. My name is Tara Brabazon, I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University. I am the chair of this panel and I'll also be asking you the questions. Now please feel free to take as much time as you need to answer these questions. Water is available if you require it and if I ask a question and perhaps you don't understand some element of it, please stop me and I'll ask it in a different way and if you don't quite give us the information that we require in answer to our question we will ask you a supplemental. So let's begin with our first question and the first question is why have you applied for this position? Right, now you are, will always receive this handball question at the start of the interview. There are reasons for that. Firstly, it is a way to relax you. It's also a way to relax the panel. Remember, often the panel themselves are quite nervous. There's a dean, a DVC, a vice chancellor that's often the chair of the panel and people are a bit scared. So you'll see particularly in the first two or three interviews of the day, people are a bit tentative. So this is a way to relax the panel as well. So this mode of question is always asked and therefore you can always prepare for it. Now while it is a handball question it's not a handball answer. You have to demonstrate in your answer that you have an intense connection with the university, with a department, with its staff. You have to know the staff in the department to which you are applying and their research and you have to name it and the connection to your own work. The last interview I did Five of the six candidates, when asked this question, said, you know, why, why have you applied for this job? They said, oh, I'd like to work in Australia. They didn't mention the university, the department, the city in which they would be based, nothing at all. Now, I know this will come as a surprise to you, but the one person who actually talked about the department got the job. So after this handball, we then move into a discussion of research. And this is one of my favourite questions ever asked in an interview. It came from a real interview. A great friend of mine in Canada asked it. So here we go with the research question. You ready? Thank you very much for that answer. We'll now move to the research area of our interview today. And could you tell us the topic of your second book? What a river. Now, sadly, at the moment, in Australia right now, books aren't seen to be terribly important. That's a great tragedy because around the rest of the world, books remain the gold standard for research. Full stop. If you forget about books, you can forget about a career in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, much of Europe, Aotearoa, New Zealand, a lot of Asia, pretty well all of Africa, basically everywhere that's not Australia. So Australia will have to turn around again because it's starting to get a little bit embarrassing because books really do matter. But the key that makes this question so magnificent is it focuses on the second book. A great Canadian mate of mine asked this live in an interview and I just thought it was brilliant because it's saying, right, well, you've done done your PhD, that's great, that's your first book, we'll take that one as read, let's now move to your second book because that's allowing us to assess if you've got research momentum, a research trajectory, indeed a research career. And just a note to my wonderful science guys and gals out there watching this vlog going scientists don't write books, if you hear that stuff it always makes me laugh because you think about scientists not writing books and you think of like Charles Darwin 
Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking. Scientists write remarkable books that change the world. So always remember that. Scientists change the world through their scholarly monographs. Okay, so that's research. Let's now move to teaching. And this is really, 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 really important. And this is one of those deep truths that I'm sharing with you this week. And it's a truth that very few people actually talk about. A university's budget is based on undergraduate teaching. So the guys and the gals who get in there and do the heavy lifting in first year teaching, in upper undergraduate teaching, they pay the bills of a university. Now, no one tells you this, or they very, very rarely do. Uh, the person who always told me about this was the great leader, the great vice chancellor in my life, one of the greatest human beings I ever met. His name, he was formerly a vice chancellor, he's now going on to huge leadership posts in higher education around the world, but his name is Stephen Schwartz. And I always remember that Steve was an outstanding, and he's an outstanding scientist, but also has a deep love for the humanities, and he's one of the greatest communicators I've ever seen on planet Earth. And it's always funny watching how people engage with vice-chancellors. It always looks a bit like a Monty Python skit, to be honest with you, because there's a vice-chancellor and all these people are sort of following them. <laughs> And when they think they can get a bit of curry uh, with a vice chancellor, get a bit of traction with a vice chancellor, they often say very naughty things. And I always remember one guy said to Steve in a meeting, I was in the meeting as a B level academic, B level teacher in the humanities, I just won the National Teaching Award. Okay, so I was in this committee, and this guy <laughs> um, was, was sitting next to Steve and said to him, uh, you know, oh, something random about, oh, look, who needs a Bachelor of Arts? We should close close the humanities down at this university. And this guy was going on about this, and Steve stopped him in mid-sentence and said, just a reminder, just a reminder, mate, uh, the Bachelor of Arts pays the bills for this university. Boof! Great. So, guys, if you're going to get a job, you're going to have to not only be an outstanding teacher, but you're going to have to demonstrate that you're an outstanding teacher during an interview. So even if you enter a research post, say you get a postdoc, and they're rare, but say you get a postdoc for two, three, four, or five years, yep, say you get that. When it finishes, if you still want to be in work, you're going to have to move to what's called a standard academic contract, which is teaching and research. Research doesn't pay the bills of a university, teaching does. So let me now ask you a cluster of teaching questions and then I'll show you some of the answers to them. So you ready? Teaching section, here we go. Tell me about your philosophy of teaching and learning. In what ways have you brought research insights into your teaching? Tell us about your strategies to maintain your research and research activity while fulfilling the teaching expectations of a university. Yeah. What types of technology have you used in your teaching? And how do you manage geographically dispersed campuses, particularly creating a teaching team and ensuring learning quality between the campuses? Ooh. They're amazing, aren't they? They are real interview questions. People got those in real time without prep. So let's make sure you're prepared. Make sure you've got a philosophy of teaching and learning. Saying that you believe in student-centred learning is not enough. People like me will pull that apart in 25 seconds in a supplementary question. So have a world view of what you think is important in teaching and learning. Have some educational tech material prepared. So talk through the interfaces you've used, if you've used Blackboard, if you've used Moodle, talk about innovative things, great things you've done, like with, say, discussion fora or social media. Then prepare a piece on team teaching, collaboration, quality assurance, assessment, moderation. If you've used rubrics, say that. And if you've got expertise working in multi-campus environments or with international students, 
brilliant. So now guys, where we're going to is administration and we're doing well, we're, we're over the hump of the interview. We're now at administration. Now administration around the world gets a pretty bad rap. I focus on, so I don't wake up in the morning and go, yay, I've got a day of administration in front of me. But what I do do is I have profound respect for quality assurance. If I don't do my job, then students don't get their results. Quality assurance, moderation may be threatened, and the university's results are not available for public scrutiny. So administration matters. Never get sucked into that negative stuff about forms, 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 forms. We are paid by the public purse, and the public have a right to have us accountable to that money. Full stop. So you're going to get a question about whether or not you can manage administration. And this is not just simply being a head of school or being a course director, guys. For example, if you're running a large first year course, if you're running a grade centre in Blackboard, <laughs> uh, you know how to manage administration. Yeah, so I'm proud of you. That's a big gig. So whenever anybody hears a, an abusive statement about administration in an interview, that person is not appointed because they're not taking professionalism, fairness, transparency, transparency seriously. Best example happened to me in the last interview panel I was on. This was unbelievable. Chaired by a dean. And a guy in an interview clearly had a brain explosion and he, when he was asked a question about administration, he said, oh look, I just simply believe in the core business of a university which is teaching and research. And that was his answer. Now there was a pause from the panel, very experienced panel, and there was a pause. And then the dean who was the chair of the panel said, colleagues, I'll take the final three questions of the interview. And I was thinking, we've only asked two questions. On my list, there are eight to go. So I'll just be quiet and let the dean lead it. So the dean asked three rapid fire questions. The interview finished in 17 minutes. It was meant to take an hour and the gentleman was shown out. At the point that that happened, the dean then said, I will not have anybody disrespecting this university in that way thanks for playing. So those of you that are thinking of working in the United States or Canada, service is taken incredibly seriously. I do love the word service. You will, ha you will have to select and serve on a committee. That's part of what the faculty does. Now I really like the North American approach to this because I believe every single day every one of us gets to university and we serve our students, we serve our colleagues, we serve our society. That's our job. So here is your question in this area. How do you intend to make a contribution to this school through service? Yeah. So what you need to do is focus on collaboration, focus on commitment, use the word service back with them, start to be comfortable with that word, and specify your particular interests. So I have a big interest in teaching and learning, I would like to be and serve on an assessment committee, I'd like to be an early career researcher rep on a research committee. So if you've been, for example, a postgraduate rep at Flinders, you're already nearly there. So the key is the committee are trying to see that you are not selfish that if they hire you, you will not simply focus on your teaching and your research, you will care for your colleagues. Right, so we're doing well. Let's now get to the second last series of questions. And these ones are about you. This is where they're assessing what sort of person you are, what sort of scholar you are, what sort of colleague you are. These are the tricky ones, these are the emotional ones, everything can go wrong very, very quickly from here. What they do, and why I'm going to ask a few of them, is they require examples. Okay, and examples are incredibly difficult to come up with on your feet or indeed sitting on your butt in an interview. So let's see if I can prepare you for them now. And yes, they do intentionally leave them to the end of the interview where you are tired. That's intentional. That's the point. So here we go. Wow. Tell us about a situation in which you managed conflict. How do you manage deadlines? Give us examples. Tell us about when something went wrong in your life and how you made it right. 
tell us about how you've managed difficult situations between colleagues that didn't involve yourself. How do you handle student complaints or critiques by colleagues? And tell us a time you made us, I'll say that one again, tell us about a time you made a mistake and how you corrected it. Right. So guys, these are horrible questions. And I've got worse ones than that. I'm about to give you the worst question I ever got in an interview. This is me personally, what happened to me in an interview. Now, some of you may know I was married before I met Steve. It was a very short marriage. It was a nightmare. It was a terrible experience. I don't talk about it because it is private. It is personal. I tend to carry the pain quite tightly. But I don't hide it because it is important to know all of you out there and people that might be going through a bad point in their life that something terrible can happen to you in your early 20s and you can survive it so that's incredibly important so remember that if you're having a bad year guys but I was asked in an interview and I'll be really clear here this was in Australia and it was by an Australian Vice Chancellor and I was asked in an interview how do we know that you won't treat this department like you treated your first husband For real. Yeah. So, guys, this bit of the interview can get a little bit messy. Uh, so here's how to handle it. This is the tip. You really need to do this. Keep it professional. Keep it as far away from your personal beliefs and personal life as you can. Keep the emotion out. They are asking you questions to provoke emotion. Do not produce emotion. What I want you to do is know the questions are coming. Breathe swallow, compose yourself. For the women out there, lower your voice so that the emotion doesn't build up in your neck, okay? I also want to make sure before you go in, you have good professional examples of how you've handled conflict, collaboration, rows or fights between colleagues, how you manage time, and also you always get a question like how you handle critique or how you manage errors. The key is to show what they're trying to see is that you are in control. You are professional. You're not being dragged into emotional stuff. Remember, this is an interview. It's not Facebook. They're different. So don't be provoked. Know the questions are coming. Be calm. Right. Well, we're nearly through the interview. There is one question to go. And the question is always the same. And you can always prepare for it. So here is the final question, yay. Have you got any questions for us? Right, so for the early career researcher, can I say there are different answers for a later career researcher, but for the early career researcher, this is a purely performative question. It gives you one last chance to show that you have expertise and knowledge about that institution. So go into their website, find a policy on early career researchers, online learning, andragogy, it could be support and mentoring. Find something you're interested in, pull that policy out and make it into a question and ask it. So you're confirming once more that you know about the institution, you've respected them and that's why you're coming to this institution because you like what they do. Okay, so as you can see the interview is a very very complicated sociological space understatement but they are really important so do all the proper things guys make sure you sleep well relax do a bit of yoga if you can stay off the booze okay most important thing please for two three four days before an interview do not drink alcohol be physically fit be mentally strong be the best person you can be as a maximum, they often only last for an hour. So you only have to be strong and hold yourself together for an hour. Yes, there are weirdo institutions that are doing weirdo things with interviews and we might have a weirdo vlog one week we might just talk about the weirdo stuff that universities do there is a great story and it is a true story because it happened to steve uh, he had two days of interviews at a particular institution he was in a beautiful armani suit to do those interviews because he's a very stylish man and uh, they made steve go to a building site and put on a hard hat as part of the interview
Yeah, there's all those stories. So we'll do the weirdo stuff later, but mostly it's straightforward. It's one hour and you just have to be your best self for one hour. So guys and gals, I just want to say thank you so much for all your support, all your encouragement. I probably don't tell you all this enough, but it is so lovely to have you come in this office, send me messages. I get hundreds of messages of support and care and love and respect every single week, and you all are just extraordinary, and you make the job so worthwhile. It is service, but you make that service just absolutely terrific. So thank you for being you. And as always, you've given me homework for next week. I have one of the hardest vlogs next week that's really got me thinking. So that's fantastic. Keep the suggestions coming in. I'll do my best to answer them. But as always, I wish you for the coming week, week love, light, and peace. You're fabulous. Tia. Bye.